in the bathroom. She don't come in, come at all. She don't come. She's something so hey, right, hard. She's gone. Shadi, don't eat your cover. Shadi, don't eat your cover. Shadi, don't eat your cover. Oh Lord, you are the light who shone upon those who were in darkness, and they were illumined. Upon the blind, and they recovered their sight. Let your face now shine upon us, and we shall be illumined by you. Walk in the way of your gospel teachings, and glorify the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our day. Sometimes with a B or the V, Saba. Sometimes he's called Sabas the Commander. He died in 372. And we'll come back to this hopefully in a little intro of the history. But he is <clears throat> the Gothic people come like many of these other horse tribes, these people that come down, the Huns, the Hungarians, the Goths. The Visigoths, the Ostrogoths, <coughs> these are people coming from the east and they move into the domains that the Roman Empire had been in for centuries. They begin as raiders at many times, or on the fringe. Sometimes they're being incorporated into. So today, for example, we have the reading where St. Paul writes saying that in Christ there is no Scythian or Greek or Roman. The Scythians or another horse people that were known actually even before in, class, in the classical world. Basically the area of what's the modern day Georgia. But the Goths come into an area that is um, Moldovia. So that eastern, southern eastern part of Europe. And while Constantine made Christianity a legal possibility in 313, and it will still be until the end of the century before the uh, religion becomes the religion of the Roman Empire. The Goths are coming at it, of course, much later. But it means that in the later 300s, a number of the Goths are beginning to embrace the gospel because they're in contact with Constantinople. They're being incorporated into the imperial uh, workings, the imperial system. And so Sabas is one of these original well, not, maybe not one of the first ones, but one of the early ones coming in. He converts to Christianity as a young man. When he dies, he's only 38, so, you know, he's still a young man when he dies. But probably in his adolescence, he embraces the gospel. And the chieftain of the Goths is very opposed to this. He's, it's argued about the questions of whether he's opposed to Christianity as such. What it seems like is 
He's opposed to Christianity for the gods. And it's a way for them to keep their, their personal identity by remaining faithful to their pagan gods. And what Sabas does then, of course, is considered by the chieftain, by the king, as being treacherous, a traitor. You have the same thing going on now in a place like India. So you have the president of India, Modi. Modi belongs to the BGP or whatever it's called, the, Hindu, the Hindutva. The religious party is what governs India. And the understanding is, is it's fine if you're a European that shows up in India and you're Christian, that's okay. Because Christianity is a European thing. And so, um, Athenaric, the, the chieftain, that was something along the same idea of his mentality. So, for example, one of the things he did is he brought a chariot with one of the idols of the tribes and brought it before the building, the tent, the shelter, whatever it was, where the Christians used for divine liturgy. And the idea was he, they had to show devotion to this idol. So he would do things like that in order to make you show your fidelity to your loyalty. And the reason why I mentioned India is because about a decade ago when I went to India, or even at this point, 15 years ago, and I arrived in Bombay, and about five days before I arrived in Bombay, there had been an Indian priest, Catholic priest, who had been murdered outside the city. They cut off his hands, and they drove nails through his eyes. So he was murdered in a very barbaric way because he was an Indian and a Catholic, and that was considered by these lunatics unacceptable. And so he was clearly martyred for this reason. They would have no issue with me showing up, you know, European Americans, the Western world, they don't have a problem with that. And Athenaric was the same idea of for the Goths, because clearly they had Christians around on diplomatic missions with the Goths, um, merchants intermingling, but the problem was when someone like Sabas embraced the gospel, that became the issue. And so he winds up professing the faith quite openly. And in fact, the village that he's in, when the authorities, when the soldiers come, and everyone's kind of denying Christianity, some of the pagans there said, well, we'll vouch for you that you're not a Christian. You don't have to renounce your religion. We'll just tell them you're not a Christian. And so when the soldiers came, he made it quite publicly that he stepped forward and told them, you do not have to vouch for me because I am a Christian, and he professes his faith. Ultimately, Sabas in 372 is condemned to death to be drowned in the river. And he is, he's taken at Easter time. He's, celebra he's taken because he is celebrating Easter. I don't know how many other people are with him. It may be very small at this point. But the priest and he are, are arrested, and he is condemned to be put to death in this river, to be drowned. It's one of the tributaries going into the, I guess, the Rhine. And his profession of the faith is they first they drag him naked through the briars as part of a punishment, and then condemn him to being drowned. He professes the faith so much and talks about Christ and the gospel and everything that the soldiers actually just think he's a lunatic. You know, you're just a fanatic, and you know, if we just let him go, no one will really know. And so in the profession of the gospel, he makes it very clear that the, the, the uniqueness and the truth of the gospel, and in the end the soldiers decide, well, they really have to do this. And so the way that he's killed is with a big pole that's forked to hold it around the neck so you hold him under the water until he drowns. So that's the way Sabas dies in 372. And like I said, he's about 38 when he dies. So his feast day is today. It's, a, uh, it's around Easter. Um, we have other, the Western Church also has saints uh, around mid-April, which also deal with martyrs who were killed by um, Arian and other forms of heterodox Christianity. So in any case, so today is Saint Sabas. In fact, there's a lot of saints this week. And it's kind of a shame because we don't actually celebrate their festivals because during Bright Week we only celebrate just Easter this week. So, all right. Now we wanted we simply got to go back into our book. We'll get back to the Patriarch's letter, you know, to finish up by the end of this month. But when we go back to our introduction, we had just begun to introduce the distinction, the biggest distinction between East and West, 
for the last thousand years is the idea of the faith seeking understanding. So we left off talking about the fidens quaerdens intellectum on page, um, just an introduction on page 10 or X for those who don't. And so we mentioned about the beginning of scholasticism or what's known as scholasticism, which begins about the 11th century. So the break, the definitive break between Constantinople and Rome is also the 11th century. One of the biggest reasons that takes place ecclesiastically for this break between Rome and Constantinople is also a cultural and linguistic thing, language thing that's been going on for centuries. So, for example, if you read, you know, because she's, vogue, she's in vogue now, um, St. Hildegard von Bingen, if you read her writings, she will sound very Eastern, because she's living in the 11th century. It's one of the things that struck me when I was working in Geneva, is we used to, you, people would come to visit Geneva all the time. It's in the middle of Europe, they'd come, they'd always, we had lots of visitors when I was there. But one of the two things that we always had to do is we had to go to the shrines. People, everyone who visited, they wanted to go to the tombs of St. Francis de Sales and St. Jane Chantal. That was about a half an hour from where I lived. And then the priest all wanted to go to the Kiri of ours, which yesterday I went to the cathedral. It was very impressive. If you missed it, is, you missed a, a great source of grace. It was very beautiful. Um, so <clears throat> ours was a two-hour drive from where I lived. Geneva. But um, you could go to the fortress where St. Francis de Sales worked as a young priest in his late 20s. And what had happened there is that by the events that took place after him, so he's living in the late 1500s, early 1600s. He dies in 1622. The castle that's there is actually rebuilt. It's because of all the wars that go on in these areas and the land going back and forth. What happens is, is when they blow up, because when the castle is going to be lost, the fortress will be lost, they actually blow it up so that the enemy doesn't have a fortress to use against them. When they blow it up, what they wind up doing is the rubble that comes down actually buries the chapel, the ground floor chapel, that St. Francis de Sales would say Mass in, in the late 1500s. Which was very impressive because when you went into this chapel, and you can still go into this chapel today, because it was excavated and restored in the 19th century, the painting in the apse over the altar is still there. And when St. Francis de Sales was saying Mass at that altar in the late 1500s, that painting was already 500 years old. So it was old for him when he was there. Okay, this is one of the things that I love about Europe, is you just constantly, constantly submerge in historical facts. And so things like the burning of Notre Dame, when you understand what these places are, and that there's a Roman temple in the basement of that church, how ancient these places are, it's very profound. It's like being in Damascus. When you go to the Mosque of Omar, in the Umayyad, the Umayyad Mosque in Damascus, that building is from the 8th century. But it's on the foundations of the previous Christian cathedral, which is built on the old Roman temple of Jupiter Olympus, which is built on the old pagan foundation of the Syrians of uh, Hadid, or whatever the name of the government. When you stand there and appreciate the fact that you are standing on a spot which has been religious for 5,000 years, yeah. and now you stand in this mosque, it's quite extraordinary. So what was impressive, though, is, of course, when St. Francis is saying Mass at this altar and the painting that's in front of him, as you're all facing east, it's a big or a, a, a mandaro. It's a big aureole around with Christ in glory in the center and the four gospels in the corners of this apse. It's very, it's very iconographic in the sense of Eastern look because it was done in the 11th century. It's the 11th century when everything shifts. So 1054 becomes the date of the break and the final no more communication between Rome and Constantinople. And it becomes the shift because you also have the birth of St. Anselm. 
St. Anselm is born in the 11th century, and he is the beginning of the father of scholasticism, the school movement, the intellectual movement of articulating more profoundly philosophically, um, we would say theologically, but you'll see the word theology doesn't actually mean that. Um, the notion that, and so he begins a movement which 200 years later is going, you know, from the 10 hundreds, is going to reach a peak of perfection with the University of Paris and St. Thomas Aquinas in the 12 hundreds. That whole scholastic movement. But by that time, by the, by that, over that 200 year period, you have a very definitive and distinctly Western way to express Christianity that is different from in the year 1000 when basically other than being in Latin or being in Greek they're basically using the same kind of modality it's why when you listen to the music written by Hildegard it's strange to our ears but it is something that was she's not unique she didn't create a musical type she's writing in the mode we just don't have a lot of other records left of the musical, because it's also the beginning of the development of notation of music. You know, think about that, you know, we're so used to being surrounded by everything being digitalized and recorded now. Everything was living tradition. As I've mentioned to you before, for us in the Syrian, for the Maronites, Syriac tradition, the music's only been written down in the last 50 years. But that whole development of use of musical notation and things is being beginning to develop around the year 1000 for the West. And so Hildegard is part of that. She's not inventing the music, but she's part of that whole movement. And so when you read her writings, her, her quote-unquote visions and all that, her descriptions of things, you know, and her, her, key, her key, key terminology of talking about veriditas, greenness, about the idea of vitality in life, she's using terms which in many ways will kind of echo Saint Ephraim, for example. So she will talk about the Incarnation as, as Christ clothing himself with humanity. That is directly from the Syriac and from the Eastern Fathers, the same, exact same imagery. Okay, who's Hildegard? Hildegard von Bingen? She was a Benedictine abbess okay. in the Rhineland know. area. Oh, okay. So she's not as famous as I thought she was. Is anybody else curious? Oh, I, I, yeah, I've heard a lot of people okay. like her. You don't know who she is. I thought she was I mean, in the book. I mean, she's used to these books. days. So, so sorry, no, she's not in the book. She's okay. not in the book. Okay. But what we're trying to explain is this distinction. So, this fides querens, the fides querens intellectual, faith seeking understanding, is a monas, is, is the scholastic Western approach to God and the mystery of revelation. It's faith. We believe, and in believing, we want to come to a deeper understanding. But that's not something which, I mean, there's greater understanding that they want. I mean, the Cappadocian fathers writing in the 300s are very clear about that. But it's not the main driving force. And you'll see on this page, one of the things he has in italics here to point out the distinction is, it's the fides adorans mysterium, faith adoring the hidden, the mystery. Right? That is very much the Eastern approach. The Eastern approach, and what I talk to you about so much, and you're going to hear it nonstop for the next year, is that Christianity is a life. It's not, it's not a philosophical um, essay. Christianity is something that you live. It's a reality that is lived, or it's not Christianity. And so the fides adorans mysterium, the faith adoring the revelation of the hidden mystery, that is the Eastern sense. It's also the Western sense, but the Western sense begins to say, but let's be able to express this more profoundly. So then it becomes fides querens intellectum, faith seeking understanding. Okay? So it's one of the big shifts that takes place. And this is why that whole, the, the, the century of Crusades, the 1000s, the century of the break between Constantinople and Rome in a, a definitive manner in 1054, it's all in that 11th century. So the break between Constantinople and Rome in 1054, 
1095, 50 years later, you've got the first crusades marching off to the Middle East. And so it's, it's a big uh, impact. And so even when we have the question of, for example, with Notre Dame, the whole Gothic form of architecture is considered that one of the, why does architecture change, you know, in the 12th century? Because in the 11th century, a lot of people that went to the Middle East saw different forms of architecture for the first time. And that comes back with different ideas, different forms of arches to be used, different ways of building something taller. Soap. Soap comes back from the Middle East. All right? That, that notion, they weren't, you know, it wasn't something that they used. It may be in Marseille, yes. And I was kind of wondering if this was a, um, more of a uh, modern terminology, but you, of course, hear about that uh, the Knights nice Templar brought back the sacred geometry, and I don't know if that was actually thought of it like that. that no, way, I mean, that so what you have, that what's going on in, around, in that 11th century is Baghdad is the great place. You know, if you were to look at the world in 999 or in the year 1000 and you had to estimate what the rest of the world is going to look like in the future, your estimation would have been Islam. Because the most civilized, educated schools, if you wanted to study medicine in the classical tradition of Galen, of Greece and Rome in the classical world, you went to Baghdad. You went to the Middle East to study. Okay? You went to what was called the House of Wisdom. In, um, in Baghdad. So this is a shift that begins to take place in that 1000th century, that 11th century. And then since that time we've just moved further and further and further away. So remember when we talked about the Lex Credendi, Lex Orandi. The Lex Orandi statue at Legion Credendi of Prosper of Aquitaine that we did. That is something which Prosper of Aquitaine is expressing in the 4th century, and it's very Eastern. The heritage of the way we live as a Christian, the way that I learn from my parents, unbroken from their parents, unbroken from their parents, unbroken from their parents, that way of living and that way of praying teaches us what we're actually believing. That's why all the explosions that took place in the 60s and 70s are so dramatic, have been so fundamentally dramatic in Christianity because we broke all habits and manners of practice. So we have to read the patriarch's letter to learn what our tradition has been for the last 1500 years. So we have to learn it intellectually and try to put it in the practice because we haven't had the continuity from our parents, our grandparents, and that. We've broken the chains. And that's why this is so desperately sad at this moment. And why next year, so as we come up, May 7th, right, is the second anniversary that we've, we've been able to make it through all together here. And so, starting next fall, it's all going to be on the liturgical life and the liturgical year. Why the year, the weeks are broken up the way they are, the divine mysteries, the way we practice these things. And that's why I said that you're going to hear it much more often talking about Christianity being a life that is lived and not just simply a, a belief that we ascribe to. Okay? This is a great importance. Because when it's lived, then you know you're Christian because you're living as a Christian. You may deceive yourself in the illusion that you're Christian because you know the Jesus story, but you don't practice any of it. You don't act as a member of Christ. And so that's what we opened up. Once you bring out the chasm between intellect and the will or the heart and the way that we live, we open ourselves to the possibility of delusion, thinking we're Christian but not acting as Christians. But of course, historically, certainly for the first millennium of the church, no one would have ever thought that way. The actions being different. And that's why on this page it's a great importance of the aspect talking about the Eastern tradition as being the Fides Adorans Mysterium. <coughs> now the book that he's quoting is from Robert Murray. Robert Murray is a Jesuit. It's a really fantastic book. Robert Murray is a Jesuit. He is a, a Byzantine, Byzantine priest. Um, and he gives uh, the, the symbols in the church and kingdom is on the Syriac tradition. So the catechism that he quotes here, the catechism of the Catholic Church, which of course is the Roman catechism of the 1990s, he says in the East, you'll notice the quotation there towards the end of that paragraph in the middle of the page. 
that the East witnesses that too much systematizing produces the illusion that the mystery of God can be exhausted through such a process. The human mind is very, very, very powerful. But because it has the ability to articulate and philosophize and do all of these things, it does open itself up to the possibility of the delusion that we can actually understand God. And see, and the fathers would never have gotten there. And that's why when they use the term theology, theology only means that focus upon God and God alone. It's not about the work of redemption, it's not about the mysteries, it's not about the sacraments, it's not about the mass. That is not theology. That they encompass under the much larger term of the divine economy, or the divine plan as we often translate, the divine economy. The way God has arranged his house, the divine economy. Oikos, nomos oikos. So the, 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 the organization of the house, or the law of the household. That's what economy means. So the divine economy is the way God organizes creation and creation's healing through redemption. So, for example, to go back to the question of St. Anselm, whose feast was on Sunday, corresponded with our Easter Sunday, April 21st. And to give you an idea how, the, how that world lived in the year 1000, is that St. Anselm is born in what is now northern Italy in the mountains of northwestern uh, of the boot, uh, towards the, uh, the Mount, uh, Mont Blanc and then the whole of the Alps, moving into the French Alps, that whole area. He's born in Iosta, but he becomes a monk in Beck, which is now what we call France. But he dies <coughs> as the Archbishop of Canterbury in what we now call England. All right, so, the idea of, you know, borderless, because the idea was this is the Christian thing. Now, all of the educated people in Europe read, and many of them spoke, Latin. And so you can move like that among the educated classes because you're not speaking your local Patois dialect. You have that ability. And we all believe, we all have the exact same faith. And so you can finish that way. But St. Anselm is the one who begins to start describing the work of redemption in juridical terms. That Jesus dies and his death is a payment of redemption to buy back from the devil a fallen world. He starts using juridical terms, which is very much part of the Western view of redemption. It's not an Eastern view, but it originates very clearly with St. Anselm as he tries to start bringing about this greater understanding and describing things and thus also initiating the whole scholastic movement. Okay? So far so good? So now we've gone, at this point in the year 2019, we've gone another thousand years on two different roads, east and west. The faith technically is the same catechesis, but we have such different visions of the way the Christian mystery is received, so that to most Westerners in Europe or in the United States, orthodoxy looks weird and unrecognizable. And so the attempt has always been, well, try to look more Western. And of course, the Maronites, because of the huge connection between the French and the Italians for the last thousand years, has always had that big influence upon. So we are the least looking Easterners of all Easterners, and we are the least Westerners of the Eastern connection of making this bridge between East and West. So one of the things that, we are, that I will try to do while we're here is moving us back to the vision of St. Ephraim and this kind of vision of faith adoring the mystery, okay? like Father Salim puts down here. Because it really is the essence of it. But that's why I start out by giving you someone like St. Hildegard, because, or well, even St. Anselm, I mean, during his lifetime, because what they're doing is something which was very universal East and West. It wasn't, there wasn't this huge chasm between the two of them. Um, but there's a movement among the Westerners since the 1800s 
There is a book called The Mysteries of Christianity. With this massive, it's just this really nice five, six hundred page tome that you wade through. Like, like, the, like wading up to your waist through mud in the swamp because you have to go really slow with it. It's written by a Catholic priest whose name is Johannes Merler, M-O-H-L-E-R, who was a favorite author of Pope Benedict XVI. But what this book called The Mysteries of Christianity is about is in, by the time we arrive in the 1800s, we have heterodox thinking about Christianity of men who were teaching that the Trinity can be explained by process of logic and use and they would accept that it's a mystery, meaning God has to reveal his Trinitarian person. But once it's revealed, the human mind can explain it. Now, they're harkening back to St. Augustine writing in the 300s, who for the first time gives us autobiography. Now, we forget about St. Augustine's Confessions. It's the first autobiography that we have any records of, of someone writing about what I think. Most of the classical world, when Cicero or Seneca or anyone wrote about things that they were thinking about, they would either speak in the third person or they would speak just simply about the idea. But St. Augustine is the one who starts telling you the way he felt at 17 at the university in Carthage. And he starts talking. So for him, when he tries to do, he has a book called De Trinitate, on the Trinity, on God. He used a totally introspective thing in which he expresses in psychological terms, the reality of the Godhead, of the Father being the thinker who in reflecting conceives his idea mentally, which is the world word, internally of the idea, and of this love that we have for ourselves centered being the spirit and the living breath. So he uses this whole internalized psychological approach to express Trinity. Now, in the, in the 1800s, in the 19th century, you have a whole group of people in that sense, because you can read De Trinitate, and it's very beautiful, and I recommend that you do read it. It does give you some grasp of understanding you know, the mystery of God. But again, it's just that. It gives you something, to, a touch point, to have some idea of who in God is. That, but that's it. It's not an explanation of God. Because, of course, at some point, that word becomes something real outside of God in the Incarnation. So, I mean, only go, images only go so far. But by the 1800s, and the Church condemned them. Vatican, it's one of the things Vatican I condemned, was the idea that you can rationally explain the mysteries. The reason why I bring this context up is because this priest, Johannes Merler, wrote this entire book, the Mysteries of Christianity, to show you all of the places in the principal doctrines of Catholicism. He, 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 his, the purpose of the book is to show you all of the principal junctures where it is unfathomable and completely inexplicable. <laughs> so the book is written to make you confused. <laughs> Which I find, I mean, I have loved, this is one of my, this is, this is one of the books that I grab when the house is burning, right? I take my scriptures, because it is filled with like 30 years of notes and margins, and it's like, I could never do that again, I'll be dead before I could do that again. And the other one are all the notes that I have written in Ioannis and Merler. So you'll probably hear much more about Merler next year when we start doing the Fides, Querens, or Adorans Mysterium to show you where the nexus, what the incarnation, what are the things that blow all the fuses when you actually do try to think about what the incarnation is. And so his whole book is to show the nexus, those junctures that when we put in words, the word made flesh. So he'll go to, well, what is the possible juncture between divine word and made? And where is the unfathomability? They go on for pages on that. And then the idea of being made human. What sense? How does time correspond? How does this go with eternity? So it's an absolutely brilliant book. And it was translated by a Jesuit in the 1950s. 
It's almost a century after the book. What was the original language written in? German. German. Okay. So the Germans are the ones in the 1800s who begin the Western Latin movement back to the fathers. They start quoting the fathers. They start going back to these Latin and Greek fathers and adding them much more in, and not just simply by a citation to put in to win a syllogistic argument of apologetics, but actually the whole text. And the idea, so there's a lot of the fathers quoting this book, which in the 1800s was actually quite shocking. Because, you know, Roman Catholics didn't do that. And all of a sudden you've got, you know, like whole paragraphs of St. Cyril of Alexandria. But that is also the same reasons why the Eastern saints that are on the Latin calendar, St. Ephraim, St. Cyril of Alexandria, Cyril of Jerusalem, they only appear on the Latin calendar in the late 1800s. They're put on very recently relative to the history of the Roman Church. And of course now we have St. Charbel on the Latin calendar. So you have a great movement, and that's why by the middle of the 20th century, icons start popping up in your local Roman Catholic churches because now they're beginning to understand that these aren't just funny looking flat pictures of people with distorted you know, anatomical features long fingers and bulbous foreheads, right? They begin to understand what these pictures are supposed to be doing, right? So, it's a long explanation just to come up to the, to the idea of there is a mystery that has been given to us. And I touched on this on Thursday of the Mysteries. You know, when St. Paul says, what I have received, I have transmitted to you. And so I, I have given to you, I have handed over to you. And I use the term of transmitted presence. The notion of the mysteries, the notion of what is confected within the church, the reality of the altar. This is a presence which is given to you as revelation. It can't be proven. You either have the grace to believe this presence and see it, or you won't, and you will wander away from it. But it's the reason why the, the sacrament, what we call the sacraments and all of the structural liturgical and everything, these are all scaffoldings around the divine presence which is transmitted from generation from generation. It's one of the reasons why we call the church apostolic. These men are in contact with the divine presence incarnate and they confide it to another generation, they confide it to a next generation and that's the way this lineage is meant to be transmitted of one life to the next generation of life to the next generation of life. So the divine, this, this transmitted presence is the reality of Christianity. And that's why in one way it's the easiest thing to transmit the same way that you taught your children to speak English. Did you ever sit down and do grammar with them? Did they speak English before they went to kindergarten? Of course they did. They learn some tools, grammar, stuff like that, spelling bees. But they already learned how to speak in the idiom that we call English because they just absorbed it from you. And that is the way the transmitted presence was meant to be passed generation to generation most commonly. There will always be adult converts. But it's why our Lord elevated the other scaffolding of that the union of a husband and wife was meant to be a sacred mystery itself to transmit that divine presence to the next generation. And so as easily as we taught English to our two-year-olds, so the faith was also be transmitted in exactly the same way. That's the Eastern vision. It's not catechesis, beat you up, drag you in at, seven, you know, at the age of seven to start doing classes with the CCD teacher. The CCD teachers are just giving you terminology to make it a little more clear. But, you know, by the age of 10, if you don't have it, you don't have it. You know. So it's been delightful. Before we think of we have just one little anecdote. It's been delightful this week because we have that young family coming. They're very charming. They're with the little guys. The little blonde guys. The, little, the one with the blonde guy. So he's beginning to realize that when he comes up that there's he gets to be a blessing. So one time he's like his head, but he wants to watch at the same time. So. <laughs> but at the end of the mass yesterday, you know, before the blessing, I, you know, I, they had come. The, they came to Madame Mum and brought the two little ones, you know, for the Easter week, which is beautiful. I mean, 
and wonderful. And so before I did the blessing for the announcement, I just simply said, you know, I am so happy that you are here. You have made my week, you know, that we have the sound of, because of course the whole mass is things flying around. <laughs> the Usually that corner of the chapel is, is, um, is, is Mr. Carter, and it's very quiet. He's saying his rosary, he's got his prayers and all that, right? And so and now the corner is like this eruption of things <laughs> flying everywhere, bottle left on, you know, so there's things, all of, which was, so before I gave the blessing, I just said, well, welcome. I am so happy Aww. to have the sounds of life and this vitality of things being broken and being thrown around the place. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes you have to sing a little louder because it's like, <laughs> but it was very, very, very beautiful, you know, and that's why I actually don't even like things like cry rooms, locking behind a glass screen. The church has never had locked the children in a room. Protestants developed the idea, you send all the little ones out during services, because the, the, the Catholics have always been, this is the divine mystery. Why would I remove my child from the divine mystery to go talk with some man or woman in a classroom? Yeah, they're here, they're breaking things, things are flying around, beads are flying around, rosaries are going. And you try to keep them corral, but let's face it, if you've got eight of them, it's a little bit difficult. Yes? He also touched your vestments. He was yes, fascinated. Yes, he, he's watching like, because I'm wearing the gold all week yeah. for, for a bright week. <laughs> so he came up and, yes, he wanted the, like, the, the stole, not the shield. <laughs> But now what it is, is that when I, come, when I come into the chapel, because now, of course, you know, you're only 20 feet away, instead of being locked in the, in the aquarium at the back of the building. <laughs> so, <clears throat> now, this morning when I came out, he, you know, immediately put down whatever he had, turns around to the doorway of coming down the steps, and he's like, all eyes. <laughs> As you say good morning and talk about what page we're going to be on. And then, of course, the bells, you know, they hear the bells. And so then, you know, I turn around to do the bow when we're doing the incensation for the busoyo. And this little guy's over in the corner, and he's just all eyes, and he, and he knows when he catches my eye as I go around, and then I get this huge grin. It's absolutely charming. I am, most of my priesthood I have worked in schools. And so that's why, I mean, you know the, the parish is a bit different from a school, you know because we don't really have any little ones. And so when the little ones are there, I mean, they'll finally, you know, this is, this is absolutely extraordinary. So it's been quite beautiful. But I bring it as an anecdote, one, because it's a charming story for this week, but really because that's the way you do it. You come in, yeah, they're not paying attention when they're only two and bottles are flying around, but they're in the divine presence and you're teaching that we come here because God reveals himself in these mysteries. And so, yeah, I can get a little ruckus and papers fly around and the smell of diapers is in the air, but hey, <laughs> that's what the transmission of life is. It's quite beautiful. So we'll take a break. We can have our caffeine and we'll take a few moments. Sugar. The sugar? No, sugar. You do know that family's moving, which breaks my heart. Yeah, it's what sad. It? Yeah, they're only temporarily. How did we get them? They were just hunting around for a parish. They, they came, I guess they came here, and they obviously were impressed. But they stayed. His parents run the music camp, though. Yeah, that's what she was saying. Was telling me, yeah, the music camp, the academy in... Uh, yeah, so called academy. So right now, they have a, he told me they have a cabin next to it. Yeah, I told them to make So anyway, yeah. And then last week, we had a, a couple that came from China. Oh. They were, they were yeah. really pleasant. They were surprised, too. They just kind of came here. Dr. Haddad will be here by Labor Day, Dr. Whitman told me today, the eye doctor. And her visa issues are all set. Oh, okay, yes, that will work. So she should sure. be here by Labor Day. All right, let's continue on with this quotation that we have from Jacob Roberts, the famous but less famous brother of Carl Roberts. And the reason why it's an important quotation that Father Salim puts in here is because in the middle of the 20th century, when this text is being written, is on that whole movement with the Germans in the 1800s, the idea is we need to move more to the vision of the fathers. You know, because even in the midst of our scholasticism, we still, I mean, St. Thomas's writings are filled with citations of the fathers. St. Thomas was certainly reading the fathers, right? But he cites them, yes. I'm sorry, you keep saying the fathers. Who, are, who was the vision of before? Who was the what? You keep saying the vision of the fathers versus the vision of this. 
The vision of the fathers will be the first 700 years of the church, the okay. writings of the fathers, the way they portray the faith, the way it's described, okay. that type of the thing. You're not just talking the vision of priests versus like humans, are you? No, no, no. no, no. Okay. The, the, Sorry, the, when I hear fathers, I think priests. Okay. So the fathers are usually most often bishops. Okay. Um, so they're the, trans, they're the teachers, and then and the teachers who wrote. Okay. So of course they're a very tiny minority of all the teachers that have were around in those centuries, but they're the ones who wrote, dictated, and so and gave us very, very apt and helpful descriptions of the transmitted mystery. <coughs> so from that point of view, they're not only doctors of the church, teachers, doctors as a teacher, but also fathers. I mean, they they give an expression. And what it's also considered is they are writing down, what they're recording is the oral tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the scriptures, of their written tradition, but the oral tradition is being taught and transmitted. So really by, by the 700s, <coughs> most of that oral tradition has been recorded. So that whole kind of large vision of all of it. But they also have within them their own personal opinions, of course, and stuff like that. So you compare them, you know, the different writings. And the commonality that comes out of them is considered to be the stable position that we can say, this is the oral tradition of the transmitted faith. And so fathers and doctors of the church. Yes? I'm just kind of wondering if there are like any particular website that actually has made available the uh, writings of the early church volume, uh, fathers of the 38 volumes, you know, make it readily available and searchable? I suppose. There's a lot of them. I said, yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things online. So, yeah. I don't think you can actually really get. <coughs> well, you can if you want to pay an exhaust, you know, an enormous amount of money to have, you know, a four hundred volume library. Like thousand dollars at least. Well, yeah, well, much more than that for four. Yeah, you know, you're talking, especially because those only come out in library editions, which means that it's about ten times what you should pay for a normal book. So. This quotation here, wherever the fathers unfold their theology with its veils. All right, so the notion of veils. You know, we've talked about that in the Syriac tradition, the sanctuary, the vessels. Uh, it, it's one of the reasons why, since, you know, I, I have the altar veiled, and it will always be veiled. You will never see the marble again. Um, I mean, you can come around and look at the back if you want to know to see marble, but the veiling of all the sacred objects, things that are sacred are veiled, you know. And it was, it was very sweet the other day because people were saying, why don't you have a veil on the inside of the tabernacle? So that even when you open the tabernacle, you still don't see the vessels inside because there's a veil that hangs on the inside of the door. And it's true, that's quite common. You'll find that around. You haven't made one yet, but sometimes it's just like in a lace. Sometimes it's in a solid white satin, but you know, these things are coming. So. But with explanation, we'll just keep trying to explain the different things as we go along. I mean, we had that, people said, well, why did we have these big banners, these big colors up, green and white, you know, for, for Consecration Sundays? Well, because quite honestly, it's in the rubrics, it's in the book, directs us to hang up green and white, it tells us to do that. People don't do it because it's a pain, you gotta get out ladders, you gotta make a thing, you gotta have it around, you know, and so, you know, put a statue out is fine, you know, it's easy. Move a candle around is fine. But to start hanging up things and doing all But that's where it's from. And that's why then we just continued it into announcements by doing the dark color in the preparation for the mystery. So the question of veils, the veils of... So when he uses the term theology, we're using the classic... Now, so when we think about theology, you think about these kind of erudite, dust-covered tomes written that only priests read and nobody else. But that's not what theology is historically. So, historically, of course, the, the composition of the word theology, the first part is theos, which is just the Greek for God. Okay. And the Greek term logia, which of course is related to the word logos. Now, you have this all around. Logia is everywhere in English, you know. So you have biologia, biology. These are the word or the expression or study of, so in the sense of expression, articulation of, um, verbalization of, study of, so biology is the articulation, the verbalization of bios, life. Uh, 
right? Gaia. Gaia is Mother Earth. So Gaia Logia is the study of the Earth. So you have geology. All right, so you have all of these Logia that's in it. So for the fathers, historically, theology was not a series of books. and It was the way to articulate the contemplation of the transmitted mystery, which is God and, and God himself alone. All right, so there you would discuss the question of the Trinity, is infinity, infinite goodness. This is where you get both the, what we call the, the affirmative and the negative uh, theology. So when you start saying God is not good, and you're, you're a negation of terminology that we use in human terms, because what is good? Well, to a two-year-old, a good is a cookie, all right? To an 18-year-old, it's uh, an exciting Friday night at the bar, you know, illegally, but that's all right. And if you really have an exciting moment, you, you hook up with a girl, all right? So, and then by 35, it's the promotion. That's a good, right? And in the midst of, and then at 45, it's to be the manager in affluence and the bigger pool in the backyard. That is good. So because that's just the human experience, the word good has obviously some similarity why we call all these different things good, but obviously none of them apply to the eternal hidden one. And so the, neg the, the negative path then is to say God is not good, he is superlative good, he is the origin of everything we call good, and therefore it is ineffable, it's inexpressible, and therefore the terminology comes out to say that God is not good. Not to say that God is evil, but it's to say that God transcends this. And so you have the whole via negativa, we call it in the West, the negative way of denying, denying human limited and really in some sense unhelpful uh, human terms. But of course, being humans, that's all we can do. And so we have both an affirmation of our words and we have a negation of our words to show now, later on with the Aristotelian philosophy, they'll develop analogy, which will be more of an affirmation, but also as an aspect of proportionality. So this is the original idea of theology. Theology doesn't, didn't apply to the sacraments or the crucifixion or the resurrection. Those things are all the divine economy. Yes, Margaret May. Uh, sorry, you said theos was what again? God. Oh, okay. And then logia also is God, correct? Logia, no. That's mm -hmm. the, your study or expression. Oh, study. Oh, okay. uh, study or expression. You know, so, in biology and biologia, you're expressing your study of or consideration of life. Right? All right. So that's what's important to understand about this quotation. Yes, Larry. I'm sorry, Father. Why is the altar veil? Because it's sacred. So all of the sacred mysteries, to convey the aspect of its transcendence, is the hiddenness. You know, the way that our Mass would normally go historically is the sanctuary would always be veiled. You'd never see the altar, except for brief moments. All right? So. When you begin, that's why we have two entrances. The Baitok, I enter the house of God, that's entering the Bhima. And then the Etelavot is entering the Holy of Holies. And the Holy of Holies, like in the Old Testament, is veiled. So the altar itself would be veiled. And so the notion of veiling behind it is to communicate the idea of the hidden transcendence. And so what would happen is the first part of the readings, for example, so the first part of the Mass, the Husoyo, the Husoyo, what you're incensing is not the altar. Because during the Husoyo, the sanctuary is actually curtained. If you go, if you have occasion, if you go down, Rhode Island has a Syriac Orthodox Church. If you go to it, you will see these procedures. If you go to the Catholic Malankaris, or Malabar, Malabar perhaps not, but the Malankaris, they still, they use the veils. And so what will happen is, is the Husoyo, you have a thing called Golgotha, which is a crucifix in a place where the scriptures are on the bima. So the way, our, the way that most of our churches are set up, our scriptures and the oblations are all set up already in the Holy of Holies. So we have to keep going up to where the altar is at. But normally it would be down on the bima where the scriptures would be. In fact, many times in the, 
for the Syriacs, they would put it in the front of the bima, so people could venerate the written word of God. So, so the idea is, but the, but the scriptures themselves would also be veiled. So they would be like in a cubicle, and they would also be veiled. And you'd open the veils, bring out the scriptures, and then you bring them. That's why you process. You're not just carrying a book. They become unveiled. You open it because now we hear the word of God. That's the Kaddishah. The Kaddishah is an enthronement hymn. That you are holy, you are sacred. We are opening our ears. Have mercy upon us. Now speak to us. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Colossians with all those pauses to really make it clear that this is now God who speaks to us. And we pause and we go through it. We're not reading to the third grade class. We are proclaiming the word of God. God is now speaking through this person. That's why when I read the gospel, I read it very, I think, very slowly. With pauses at the ends of periods. And the bigger pause between a paragraph. And then we finish, then you have, this is the truth. Peace be with you. And then we sing that acclamation, the korozuto, of affirmation of this reality, and then it goes back and becomes veiled again. Now, when those scriptures are being read, and for us traditionally it's an Old Testament reading, a letter of St. Paul, New Testament, and the Gospel. There are always three readings. While that's being read, the sanctuary veils open. And you see the Holy of Holies because God speaks to you. And when the gospel is done, the veil closes again. And now the priest teaches as priest the homily. But he's standing in front of the veil transcendence of the Holy of Holies. Then... When we have the Itarot at the end, we make our profession of faith before the veils. Then we have the Itarot, Madebhe Daloho. I will go into the temple of God. I go to the Holy of Holies. Then the curtains open up, and the deacons bring the oblations that have been prepared on the, on the bima during the readings. And the procession, the deacons bring the oblations, and they process to the Holy of Holies. That's the Itarot. Yes. One of the divisions they have in the on the Melkite altar and their stage, they mm -hmm. is that like the veils? Yeah. So what happens is in the Constantinople, the veils become a wall. And they that's why your doors are all put in clothes. And, and whenever you go into a Byzantine church, the doors will always be closed in the sanctuary, except for Easter week. So if you go to a Melkite church now, the doors are on the altar, you will see the altar through the the, the royal doors will be open. I've never seen them open. Yes. Yeah, because normally, just other than this one week, because this is the resurrection and the power and the transcendence which is manifested in God. <coughs> so during bright week, the doors are open to see the altar. What do they call those divisions, those walls? They're kind of stasis. So they're kind of stasis. So then it's open, right? But we're not done yet, right? Because now there's different parts of the anaphora. So you have the anaphora offering for the veils. But then when you come, and this is the understanding of the fraction, and everybody wants to recite the prayer with the priest. You know? If you look at the rubrics, there is nothing for the con it is nothing about the congregation reciting this prayer. Now, traditionally they may sing it, and we have our Arabic versions and that, and they're very beautiful, and there's nothing wrong with it. But the idea is that we have to recite this together with the priest is actually not right, because not only does the rubric not tell you to do that, but during the point of the fraction, the veils are actually closed. You don't even see the priest and the deacons. And that's because in the writings of the Syriac fathers, that, that fraction symbolizes the death on Calvary. And the Syriac fathers say that the angels themselves covered their faces during Calvary because if they looked upon the passion, their very existence would be shattered. And so the veil would be closed for that. And then... And then it's opened again at the end for the elevation. Now you adore the risen Christ, who's been by intention and rejoining the body and blood. The o Lord, you are the pleasing oblation. So the veils would open again, and the priest would offer it up. He would turn, because of course you're all facing the east. He would turn with the blessed sacrament as the veils open. 
You, O Lord, are the pleasing oblation. And everyone would recite this act of adoration. And it is proper that when that goes up, that everyone profoundly bows in adoration of this major elevation of the joined body and blood of Christ in his resurrection. Then we articulate our response in the embrace of the divine mystery with the prayer that was taught to us verbally by God himself, Abun de Bashmayo Ned Kadesh Shmo, our Father. That's why you recite it. And that's the beginning of the communion. <coughs> then the veil closes again. And while the clergy go, while the priests and the deacons go to communion, you don't see them go to communion. <coughs> then the veils open again, and the priests would turn <coughs> holy things for the holy. In the Greek, hagia hagios. All the Eastern rites have this. The Latins do it in the Ecce Agnus Dei. Behold the Lamb of God. And the veils open at that point because it symbolizes the apostles coming from the upper room after Pentecost, bringing that transmitted mystery, and then you receive communion. All right? So the sanctuary is open during communion because the divine transcendent is communicating himself in the divine mystery of the Eucharist. So it's a little bit different vision. So when the priests during the Latin masses had to turn around and face the congregation, that was sort of in the 60s, I guess, is when it started. That's when they started standing on the other side of the altar. They pulled the altar, they just started standing on the other side. Yeah. Did that sort of start eliminating that mysterious aspect of that part of the Well, in part. I mean, there's a whole reason why they turned it around. I mean, there's a reason why they did it. Because there's a shift in Latin theology on the Eucharist in the 60s. Okay. That's why the ceremony. But that's a whole other discussion, which we'll do when we get to the Eucharist. But you know, this whole thing when the priest is standing here on the altar or touching the Blessed Sacrament, that actually is meant to be touching the Blessed Sacrament. And he stands, he's the conduit between the divine altar to the people. I mean, that's what he's doing now. It looks a little more Nazi-like because we're facing it. <laughs> yeah. So we look like some old Roman general or something. You know. For the salutes, but it's meant to be. And so you always had Shlom, Kulchun, and then he turns back to the altar, because you're all adoring the same transcendent mystery. He doesn't have his back to you any more than the lady standing in front of you has her back to you. You're all facing the same direction. That terminology of saying the priest has his back to us is ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense. This, you know, otherwise, everyone has turned their back on the back row of people in the church, which of course no one says that. <laughs> But you're all facing the east, and so when it's time to address from the divine mystery, the priest would turn. Shlom, kulchon, peace be with you. Because he's communicating this reading from the divine transcendence, and we all return because the priest is just as much a sinner in need of God's mercy before the transcendent mystery. It's not about him. So there's a huge shift that we've gone through, okay? So that's your example of veils. <laughs> well, next year in the sermons, that will be it. And what you're going to, what's going to happen? <coughs> because you're already seeing it happen. Those people who come once every 14 months, and they see you, the elevation, and everyone in the church all of a sudden goes, Phew. for the elevation, oh Lord, you are the pleasing oblation, and they're going to be standing there. <laughs> and all the people who know the divine mystery all of a sudden then make this profound bow, which is the proper <coughs> reaction okay. to the Eucharist being lifted up before you for adoration, they're going to go, oh, everything is changing. Well, it's, it's not changing. It's just that now we have a better understanding of faith adoring mystery. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen is you're going to have, it's, it's always inevitable. The more that the apostles became closer to our Lord learning from him, the more different they were from the people who just hung out in the crowd because they wanted to get a healing. It's inevitable. And then the crowd that just for the healing, they're the ones screaming, crucify him. And so you get that. It's not because you want that, but it's the more profound that you understand, it, it will have that reaction. So in this writing then, he's talking about the theology, right? So now you understand the use of the term theology here is the consideration, the contemplation of the divine in itself, God in itself, right? 
So the theology with its veils of imagery, we discover the wealth of symbols and of truths clothed in symbols. The word symbol, when we hear it in the modern world, it means a fairy tale. It means something silly that, you know, it's, it's a sign, a cardboard sign you put on with an arrow on it, it's telling you to go over here. But that's not what the word symbol means. Sum, the S-U-M, S-Y-M in Greek, means together or with. It's the equivalent in Latin of cum. So when we have compassion, to suffer with. It's exactly the same word in Greek as sum pathos. Sympathy and compassion are the exact same words, to suffer with. Okay? So the word sum is with. Balain is to throw. <laughs> and so, certainly in the Indo-European linguistics, related to our word ball. Right? So, balain, sum balain literally means to throw together. So that the symbol is bringing two things that are distinct, and it doesn't represent something else. It's bringing two things together. Now, it may be something so mundane as an octagonal red panel, but as you make your car stop at this intersection so you don't run anybody over. And so it symbolizes, what is it symbolizing? Stop movement, geographical intersection. That's what the symbol is doing. So the mysteries themselves are all symbols because they're bringing the human being, the church as an assembly, and the human being individually into contact with that transmitted presence, the mystery. So it's not by accident in the 60s and 70s we started pulling off tabernacle veils, we started coming off the frontals, we took off the, the baldacchinos off the top of the altars, we took off all the things that were saying, this place is unique in your existence. Right? That's why when I got here, I mean, I, we have made some tabernacle veils, but all the tabernacle, they're just simply the veils that have been there, and they're in pristine condition because they haven't been used in 40 years. So most of the white ones, everything else that we have up there, we just they were in a drawer in the sacristy. I said, oh, cool, we have them. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> and then, of course, so, you know, the, it's a very beautiful front tabernacle door, and it's true. But the idea is you make everything perfect and beautiful, even if you don't see it. This has come up in all the news of things about Notre Dame. The carvings that are at four stories up, no one sees it. But the carver made it there as part of his expression. You know? And so I've told the story that the tabernacle linings, there's, a, there's an IHS that's embroidered in the back of the tabernacle. Who sees it? Nobody. When I was in Kansas City, we had a lovely lady who was there. And Sue and I have discussed this. Every year, those cardboard sheets came out at Easter because that's when the tabernacle is empty. And those cardboards would come out and she would, she would re-cover them with quilting over the cardboard in white satin. But what she was doing during the winter is she's preparing them and then you, you stitch them on the back of this cardboard and they go back into the tabernacle, fresh, brand new for the divine presence of our Lord in the Eucharist. But what she did, because she came up to me one year and she says, <clears throat> she explains to me, so she would do like these large floral, paisley kind of patterns on it, embroidered in white beads on top of white satin. And she explained to me that every one of these beads is someone. So as she's stitching them, they're her grandchildren, her children, and she pointed to me, she says, this bead father is you. And so all the people that she wants to be for the next 12 months in the presence with the Blessed Sacrament, the Saboria. I thought that was, I was just a young priest then, and I thought that was one of the most beautiful things. And that in itself, that is the Catholic vision. Not like, oh, yeah, looks pretty dirty, I guess we got to change it. You change it even before those things. And so you make, you make the interior, the interior of the tabernacle can be gold, or you make it in white satin or silk, some kind of precious cloth, the interior, or you gild it. Who sees the gilding? Nobody. It's not the fact of entertaining us. 
There's a church in Chicago of the Blessed Virgin. There's a church in Chicago, and they have a side altar of the Blessed Virgin Mary. And what it's famous for is its altar, is, the side altar is open on the bottom, and there's filigree metalwork carving in front of it, so you can see that it's open underneath. But all of the metalwork with inlaid stones was done, and then actually as, a, as done only for the honor of the Mother of God, it's actually facing inward to underneath the altar to place at the feet of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So the observer kneeling at the communion rail or standing in front of it only sees the back of the metalwork. It's finished, but you don't see all the stonework. Because the work was done to express a devotion to the Mother of God and not to entertain you or to impress you by my metallurgic skills, or my jewelry skills. That's a vision that we have lost decades ago. Is that a siege on Cantius? Uh, no. No, it's not in that church. So anyway, that gives you another idea. So you make everything the best, the purest, you know, make a solid gold door of the tabernacle, and then cover it in silk. A little different. <laughs> All right, so this is why. So now you understand the rest of the quotation. And so... Father Tony has made this in bold. It's not in bold in the original quotation. So that we, we, we discover the wealth of symbols and of truths clothed in symbols, which could give new life to our modern dogmatic expressions, perhaps still all too much dominated as they are by apologetics and by canon law. This is the way you do it, according to the canons. And in the apologetics, this is why we are right and you are wrong in winning the argument. Now, this is why we go back to Hildegard von Bingen. She talks about the word clothing himself in humanity, veiling the tabernacle, <coughs> veiling the altar, veiling the ciborium. Everything's veiled because everything is sacred. It's actually in morals. Why do Christians not talk about the marital union and sex and all these things. Not because it's dirty, on the contrary, because it's sacred. You don't just simply throw it out in the streets because it is ultimately, fundamentally meant to be the communication of life and a human participation in the act of creation. That makes it sacred, so you veil these things for the same reason. Yes? We've also read um, by Dr. Alice von Hildebrand and the privilege of being a woman how she talks about uh, the female body as being veiled. Yeah. In the, you know, yeah. in the womb, the womb is veiled because it's a sacred place and uh, kind of going along with your reference there. And that's why you find even in pagan civilizations, I mean, everybody care, everyone covers their life-bearing organs. I mean, even if it's just a loincloth, there's always something about, the, everyone understands there's something you, there's something unique about them, which is different from anything else that we do as humans, that we're able to communicate life to another generation. But see, that too, we, we've cheapened that. And I don't think that it's by accident that what we did within our churches and that what we did with our relationships and what we do with the sense of procreation and bringing life into the world, they're all related. You know, when we lost one vision, we lost them all. I mean, the whole thing just came skidding. But it, this has been going on for a century. This did not happen in the 60s. The 60s are as much an effect as they are a cause of where we're at now. They, you know, they are an expression of what was going on. So it's very beautiful here because now when you think about it, the expression of either in the West with Hildegard or in St. Ephraim of the word clothing himself in humanity, then the divine humanity becomes what? The veil. To indicate to you to where the very presence of God is, the word. So that Christ is simultaneously, at that point, you understand that what does the veil do? The veil is not meant to hide. The veil both does two things paradoxically. One, it, in, it, 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 it does cover the transcendent in a certain sense, something which is beyond, not just simply mundane. But at the same time, because it does that, it is pointing out to you where the transcendent is. So that this clothing in humanity by the divine word 
is not only the same fact that this is the Word of God incarnate, but the humanity becomes a veil, which is why on Calvary, when he dies, the veil of the temple between the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place is ripped top to bottom, obviously by a divine hand, because the veil of the true presence, the person himself of God, is torn on Calvary. So he indicates in the building what has only been a foreshadowing, which is now accomplished, which is why when you read in the letter to the Hebrews, I think in chapter 10, he says, now we have to us our way which is through a living veil. So he uses the image of the temple, of Calvary, the resurrection, and what is that living veil? The Eucharist. <coughs> and so, there, there's so it, it just becomes more and more levels and layers in the whole thing. So I want to leave you with um, an image from St. Ephraim, and I believe that Hildegard, Hildegard uses the same. So that in just talking about God, all right, in the true theological sense about the person of God, the imagery which is used is the sun. Right? Again, it's just an image. It's not a proof or anything. It's just an image of the sun because the sun is fire, light, and heat. Right? It's something, so it is fire which turns out. The effect of it is heat and light which comes out. So that in seeing, all right, the perception of perceiving God is the light. We experience the heat. And behind the heat and the light, we discover the fire. Which, of course, even on this earth, you can't look at the sun without burning out your eyes. Hence, it needs to be veiled. So we don't put satin in front of our faces when it's an eclipse. We wear these kind of funny glasses or stare into a shoebox, right? So. Yes. Um, perhaps you could uh, comment on the fact when Moses came down from the mountain, had to be in the presence yeah, so of God. Of course, that you have the space. effect. He becomes, but he becomes <coughs> veiled because the people refuse to have him talk to them. He just comes down to talk to them, and he's radiating light because he's been in the divine presence. And they're the ones who throw themselves down, and they say, "No, no, 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 no," because they're overwhelmed by this. And they do not want to hear that. And that's why they say, you talk to us for God. And Moses says to them, because you will not hear the voice of God, you shall be sent to others to speak. And that's the beginning of the whole mission of prophets. They are spokespeople for God because God originally intended to speak directly on Mount Sinai. All right? So in this aspect then, the Spirit of God who moves. So we talked last week about the grace, the light that enters into the world and, and illuminates every, every human being born into the world, every man born into the world. So the experience that people will have first will be the heat of God, if you want. There is a warming of the heart and an attempt to move them towards seeing, which would be the light, moving them towards faith or the sun, the divine logos, the word. Right? But only ultimately then through the heat which will attract us, Everyone likes summer, right? We all become brain dead at camp. So this, this warmth to draw us, moving us towards the light to see. So they will compare then these aspects as images of God revealing his personage, of the spirit in the heat, the word being the light. And both of these things bring us to discover the fire of the sun, which is the Geniza Abu, the hidden father which we never see. We never see God the Father. The closest we get to it is when Philip asks at the Last Supper, when he asks our Lord, when will you show us the Father? And our Lord answers him. He says, how long have I been with you? Don't you understand that when you see me, you see the Father? Our Lord's not saying he is the Father. He's saying, this, I am the face of God. And that's why the great veil of the sanctuary is that incarnate work. And that's again one of the things that I find most attractive in the Syriac spirituality of the Kavisha. It is focused, everything is focused upon the person of Christ. You know? The evangelicals about being saved by Jesus and by personal Lord and Savior, they have nothing on the Syriac tradition. Nothing. You know? 
And then, but by contact with that veil, we always finish our prayers in Trinitarian formula. Always. Because it raises us up to that discovered fire of Father, Son, and Spirit. And we don't do the intellectualized version of the Latins that everything finishes through Christ our Lord. Amen. Which is nothing wrong with it, but it's an intellectualized version. Because for <coughs> us in the end, it is the discovery of the sun of heat and light that brings us to the discovery of fire. It's a good point to finish that. Uh, <coughs> in the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O oh God, you are before all ages, and this is from age to age. You are resplendent and glorified in unsearchable light. Through your word, you bring forth light and give us each day. O radiant day and source of all light, we glorify you, adore you, and offer you praise night and day. Accept our praise and answer our prayer. Send us your abundant blessings through the mercy of the Messiah. To him, with you and the Holy Spirit, be glory, honor, power, and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. Glory be to the Father. O Mary, conceived without sin, pray, pray for us to have recourse to you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Very good to see you all. Have a blessed evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.